Hello, everybody. Welcome into Talking Fitchburg on this Thursday, July 22nd, 2021. I'm Jeremy Crosby. Welcome into Talking Fitchburg. Hope you're having a wonderful day. You know, it's it's been a week and it's about to get a lot warmer. So if you haven't taken advantage, I was outside last night hanging out uh, you know, with a friend I've seen in a while and uh, just enjoying the nice weather. About nine o'clock. I've not had very many mosquito issues this year. But where his place was, all of a sudden it was like, boom, they were there and they were pesky. So I don't, I, I, Andrew, I know he can't, you can't hear him today. He's in a different location. Maybe I have a lot of mosquito stuff out there. You have mosquito issues? He's, he says, yes, he does. Yeah, I, we haven't had that at our house for some reason. And we live in a marshy area, so you would expect it to be. Not too bad. So I don't know. But uh, overall, uh, you know, this uh, temperatures are going to continue to get uh, hot. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the dry weather coming up in the headlines today and uh, making sure you stay safe uh, from uh, wildfires and that sort of thing. So we'll talk about that coming up in headlines. In the digest today, we're going to talk uh, uh to take a look back at the peer support uh, from Fish Run EMS's uh, side of things. And then we do have a new construction update for you today as well on Fish Hatchery Road, including talking about the Cahill Main closure uh, that'll be happening uh, starting next week. So a lot to get to here on the show. Let's start with Pack in the Park, though. Want to make sure you have uh, the save the date because it is coming up fast. And we now know the movie Tom and Jerry, the movie. Hey, Andrew, uh, have you seen this one? Andrew says, no, he hasn't seen it. So we can't tell you if it's good or bad. So you're just going to have to come out and find out yourself. Uh, anyone uh, who's interested in coming out, come out. Free carnival games, inflatables, prizes, and, of course, the screening of Tom and Jerry. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, carnival games start at 6. Movie starts at 8.15. All right, progress on the new pickleball courts uh, and path at McGaw Park. Uh, Recreation Park and sharing some of these photos uh, of uh, what's been going on out there. Looking good. That's what I'm saying. Looking good there. Again, uh, some new pickleball courts uh, coming in and then I uh, said new paths uh, being laid as well. So uh, progress is being made there at McGaw Park. All right, Bike for Kids donation day. We now have that date. It's going to be September 18th. And uh, some businesses who've already uh, committed to collecting some of these bikes will be Delta Beer Lab, WPS Health and uh, Solutions, Lexus of Madison, and Bree Stevens Field, to name a few. We need about 25 volunteers, it says, to pull this off. So if you have a few hours to spare on Saturday, September 18th, please save the date. Shifts include uh, attending a bike uh, to donation station where you'll uh, greet the donors, answer questions about uh, uh, uh bike for kids and uh, the organization uh, in handout literature that shift is from 10 a.m to 2 p.m if you're interested in signing up just got to help the website guess what we're going to share where you can find that information when we post up our headlines all right from madison uh, metropolitan school district uh, madison promise this is uh, the learning of uh, uh, virtual learning uh, platform. It says we're excited to provide a virtual learning option for students in sixth through 12th grade for the 2021-2022 school year. To enroll in the Madison Promise, students will need to make a semester commitment to the program. Application window is July 12th through August 6th. Students will need to complete an online form and answer several essay questions. Students will then be notified of acceptance into the program by Friday, August 27th. The first of our virtual information sessions uh, was held yesterday, but there's still more coming, it says here. So July uh, 22nd uh, happening uh, here at 3.30, uh, 4.30 p.m. as well. And then the session will be uh, held uh, for Hmong uh, viewers. That's uh, going to be uh, July 27th and uh, both at noon and 4 p.m. All this is online. We'll also include share the link for uh, this information. All right, drought conditions uh, are improving in Wisconsin, but we still got a long ways to go. Here's a look at that map. Uh, drought conditions are getting better. We had severe drought uh, in the uh, southeastern part of the state. That has uh, come back a little bit. Uh, however, uh, we're still uh, in uh, the moderate drought uh, conditions. So keep that in mind and uh, quickly here, uh, stay prepared uh, for wildfires. Make sure that you clean stuff around your house uh, and keep things away. There's been a lot of wildfires out west uh, and I uh, just want to make sure that you watch and stay safe uh, and keep stuff away from your uh, house uh, in case uh, you will live near uh, wildfire or wildfire area could be. All right. Take a quick break. Coming up next, we open up the digest. We have your Fitcherona EMS talking about their peer support program next right here on Talking Pittsburgh. 
The central and midwestern U.S. averages more than 850 tornadoes each year. And lately, the number of floods has been rising in the region, too. So chances are, there will be more twisters and floods near here again. And between school, sports, and social lives, chances are, you won't be with your kids when it happens. Will they know what to do? Ready.gov slash kids has all the educational tools and information to make the conversation easy. When the time comes, chances are they'll feel prepared, not scared. So talk with your family today. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. What? Why? My. Welcome back into Talking Fitchburg. Join me today from Fitchburg EMS. It's your Deputy Chief, Jeff Doslick. Jeff, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? I am doing wonderful. Good morning. Afternoon. <laughs> Whenever, whatever time this is. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Jeff. Uh, uh, today, we're going to take on a, a very uh, serious topic. Uh, and, and it's something we've actually talked about on this show uh, in different capacities, uh, not only with you, uh, but with fire police uh, and uh, many others. Uh, but peer support uh, definitely a, a big topic in uh, public safety world for sure. Uh, and uh, peer support, we'll, we'll break it all down for you. I don't want to steal your thunder by any means, but uh, uh, why is, uh, or what is peer support first off, Jeff, uh, and how are we using it here uh, in uh, Fitrona? Yeah, so peer support, you know, it, the old adage, you know, that we used to have in the early days of, you know, police, fire, and EMS is, you know, just suck it up, just handle it. It is what it is. Take it, you know, and I think that those days are are gone. Um, you know, we see a lot of we see a lot of bad things. Um, sometimes we see a lot of bad things pretty quickly. And you know, for peer support, it, it allows us to um, reach out to each other, make sure that you know that we're okay, that we have resources available to our staff um, in the event that somebody's not okay. And um, we used to, you know, I'm, I'm old school. I've been doing it a long time and you, know, you hold everything in and then eventually that, you know, starts to eat at you and we see job performance issues, you know, we see issues at home with families, uh, we see issues with drinking, alcohol, uh, drugs and, you know, and in some cases we see suicide. And so our attempt with peer support is to make sure that we can intervene quickly, recognize that, um, you know, folks are having issues with either a call or accumulation of a whole lot of calls that, you know, just kind of, you know, come, come to a head at a certain point. And um, that's why we were really, um, you know, excited to join the, the fire department, the police department in Fitchburg and, and be part of the peer support team. Yeah, it's it's hard to explain uh, in an emergency uh, or, or uh, I like to say public safety to, to kind of cover all uh, spectrums, um, but uh, the the stress level uh, that that comes with the job um, is actually part of the lessons uh, that you actually learn. Uh, I can speak from from doing EMS, uh, EMT school. Uh, that uh, that's a big section uh, in there to begin with. Uh, so what are you guys taught, uh, the men and women uh, of public safety on, on ways of dealing with uh, stress? So as part of the, the peer support team, um, our focus is to recognize that there was an incident that potentially could be harmful to, to a provider um, and make sure that we're reaching out quickly to them um, and real, really just kind of listen um, you know, it's it, a lot of times, and, and you know, because I like to talk, that, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to be quiet and, and open up your ears and your heart and try to um, understand where somebody's coming from and not make a prejudgment, um, not to say things like, oh, I've, I've, you know, I've been there, I've done that, it, it'll be okay, you'll be okay. Um, those, those things aren't acceptable. We have to understand that how I deal with something might be different than how my partner might be dealing with something or another fire department's member might be dealing with something. So um, to understand where they're coming from, to listen to what their feelings are, um, to offer some ways as a peer support member, to offer some ways that they can cope with those, um, 
with some of the feelings that they have and to, to remind them that what they do is important, um, that without them, our, you know, we, we wouldn't have the emergency services, we wouldn't have police, fire, EMS, and then to make sure that they understand that there's support out there either um, through the peer support team um, or professionally that, um, that they need to reach out and, and understand that that's, that's how we get through some of this stuff. Uh, for people who don't know Jeff, uh, a lot of times uh, public safety will do debriefings after um, major events. Might might not even be a fatality necessarily, um, or somebody who passed away. It could be just an intense call of, of whatever nature. Um, why why does public safety do that? Do the debriefing, and how does that fit into the peer support? Um, the, uh, there's debriefing. There's diffusing. Uh, the both of those things are important to. To make sure that members, um, you know, immediately just don't go home and and start to um, think about all the things that went on, they don't have an opportunity to talk to to their to their peers, to to people out there that do understand, and and to do those things rather quickly after the incident allows us to um, get some of those feelings out, do it in a way that is non-judgmental. Um, with the peer support team that we have with the fire department, the police department in Pittsburgh, um, that they, they don't take some of that stuff home right away, have a chance to sleep on it, and then don't have an opportunity to go out and express, you know, really how they feel. Um, we're really, we're really fortunate that, you know, the people that, that do emergency services have family members that understand um, what they go through every day. And, well, um, I know that I can go home and have a conversation with my wife about what happened during the day. Um, and, she's, and she understands. Um, there's a lot of family members that don't understand how stressful the job really can be. And when you have those critical incidents, it, even if it's not a fatality, um, there has to be a mechanism that we can all sit down and talk about um, what happened. You know, there's times where we talk about what went really well there's times that we talk about things that didn't go so well and how we can, you know, it's not, and it's not really a judgment on, well, let's talk about the call and could we change policy and procedure? That's really not what that is about. It's really about um, how do you feel things went on your end? How do you feel things could have been better for you? What did you see? And I think the more people talk about those kinds of things, um, they understand we're all in this together and, maybe what you're feeling is the same thing that the person next to you is feeling and you're not alone in that. And, and I think that's what's important about um, doing diffusings, doing debriefings. Uh, maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one peer support at some point. Yeah, I was going to say, I think a lot of times good taking that component and then, you know, somebody still feeling um, pretty shaken up by it, you know, I assume that you could take them up with with that peer support person uh, to help them uh, talk it out more and 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 take the steps that they need to uh, work through it. And it's not something that you have to get over necessarily. It's not something that you, you just have to come to terms with the, for what it's worth and and whatnot. As far as the peer support folks go, uh, what a, what is some of the training that uh, you're going through and and creating these peer, peer support helpers because it's a group effort. So there's a lot of people involved. Right. The, the um, CIVNIC put on a couple of trainings um, for us that went to, uh, that are part of the peer support team. There's kind of different levels. Um, and that's the training that I went through. Uh, Christy and, and um, Sarah as well with Petrona EMS went through that, those trainings um, through CIVNIC. And it really taught us the, the steps in what a diffusing would be, the steps in what a debriefing is. Um, and then talked a lot about being compassionate, um, having really good listening skills as opposed to, you know, really good talking skills. Um, and th that training, uh, I think, is, was valuable for me to understand really what people are going through. I mean, I used to be the old edge. I don't need to talk about it. I'm fine. Um, and I learned, you know, I've, I've learned the hard way that, um, you know, through my, some of the depression that I've gone through with EMS, that that's really not the way to handle it. And that training allows us to understand what others are going through and how we can talk to them and 
try to elicit a conversation about an incident versus um, giving us giving them our opinion on what that incident should have went like or how they should be feeling. Well, you don't need to feel that way. Why do you feel that way? I mean, those are just really closed end questions that um, don't allow people to express themselves. Yeah. Uh, final question, Jeff, um, and it's something we were talking about uh, before, but if you hear, a, if you see a story, you hear a story of uh, uh, somebody that's passed away um, because of depression, maybe they took their life, whatever the case may be, you hear it on the news, you hear it on, uh, from your perspective and with the peer support, uh, how, how should how should we gauge that as a community? How do we gauge that, that the, the public safety is hurting in so many different ways with the, the above and beyond stress of a pandemic, uh, let right. alone everything else out there. Um, uh, how, from your standpoint, how would you explain that to the community? Um, I, I guess I would want the community just to understand that, um, you know, we, I would venture to guess 95% of us are in this job, um, you know, obviously not for the money and not for the fame and not for the fortune, all that kind of stuff. We're in it because we really want to help people. And that's why we, you know, it, police, fire, and EMS do this. And just to understand that um, our job is stressful and we see a lot of things that um, uh, we're trained to see and we're trained to deal with, but it still affects us where maybe the general public is not trained to see, you know, a really bad car accident with a fatality or, you know, a mass shooting with, you know, people hurt and screaming. Um, and, and just to understand, put themselves in our shoes when that happens and just be sort of careful about some of the questions that you might ask your friends or you might ask a provider. I mean, we get it all the time and there's probably every provider that will listen to this is, you know, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? Well, I mean, I could tell you a, a 50,000 worst things that I've ever seen. And it's, it, it's not one thing that sits on your heart. It's a cumulative thing that, you know, the job brings to it. And, you know, it saddens me when I learn of, you know, a provider that has committed suicide. Um, and then you, you know, you think about all the times that you may have interacted with them. Um, and you just didn't listen really good with your heart. So um, just, just understand that there's a lot of stuff that we go through and that, um, you know, we also, you know, there's also, there's also all the other pressures that come with being a good provider. There's pressures at home. There's pressures with finances personally. There's, you know, if you sit in a command staff or a management position, there's pressures to, you know, all the stuff that comes along with that. Um, and then just, just to open your heart and have a little bit of, of understanding when it comes to that. And eventually we will share, we will sit down and, you know, there'll be a point where I can tell you the worst call that I ever had. Um, but that takes some time, even right now. Yeah. Now, Jeff, I think it's great perspective and, uh, you know, glad to talk about it. And I said, we've uh, got a series on this uh, with the peer support group. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's been nice to share these stories and, and talk about, uh, all of it uh, together. And we look forward to uh, uh, talking more about it with you uh, and the rest of uh, the peer support group here uh, in the city of Fitchburg. Uh, all of you have done great work and have a lot of great work to come to. So yes. we appreciate your time and uh, talking with us on this uh, in your perspective. You, and uh, Jeff, we'll uh, look forward to having you back on the show real soon. Sounds good. Thank you very much. You bet. Jeff Doslick, Petrona EMS, uh, talking about peer support. And uh, yeah, we'll keep following up on this here on uh, Fact TV. Take a quick break. More to come. You're watching Talking Pittsburgh. You'll see on page four that the projections need to be blood next Thursday. Seriously? Thursday? Can't do that. Uh uh. This is really inconvenient. I have yoga that day. I have no time for this. So. I can't do Thursday, but I can do Friday. Disasters don't plan ahead. You can. Talk to your loved ones about how you're going to be ready in an emergency. Don't wait. Communicate.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back into Talking Fitchburg. Joining me today in studio for your Fitchburg Grow Construction update, Andrew McFadden. How does it feel to hear me in person and not just on the computer? Yeah, no, it's good. It's, it's good. good to be here. I'm, I'm nervous. Are you? <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> it feels more real. Yeah. It feels more real. <laughs> Everything else before. Well, right. I miss your headset. I'm... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this this will sound a little better, I guess. Yeah, probably. with the cool mics and stuff. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, no, uh, no, I'm talking about this. We're here to talk construction, and uh, Fish Hatchery Road uh, is uh, is booming. I yeah. see they got they crushed all that concrete already. Yep, for that was sure. Pretty cool. I think they have a little bit more uh, just from kind of where that pile was sitting. But yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And they've now kind of spread it out. They started rocking all the the northern portions, um, kind of in between. K Hill up to uh, uh, High Ridge in that area. So, yeah. and I also saw yesterday, lucky, and I should have stopped and taken a picture of it. Uh, they laid the uh, pedestrian bridge down yeah. yesterday by the golf course. Yeah, that was cool. Yep, I was up there, uh, checked it out after they did it. Yeah, it looked good. Did you take any pictures, Bill? Or, Bill. Um, <laughs> uh, I, Andrew, I, I Bill. do have a picture. Yeah, yeah oh, we need a. We have to have that picture. Yeah, we'll do. All right. Um, all right. Uh, well, uh, the big thing that's uh, coming up is the closures. We talked about the closures at the intersections last week. Uh, the first uh, major closure, if you will, major mm-hmm. uh, closure at K Hill. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be closing next Tuesday, the twenty seventh, into uh, through August seventh on Saturday, and so we will still have High Ridge open that whole time and uh, Caddis that full signal there, and so. And we have the, the message boards out there right now letting people know. So please, you know, if, if you go from the north, uh, you know, if you're traveling from the south going north, just go up to Caddis and turn in there. If you're traveling from the north coming south and just pulling either to High Ridge or Caddis and, and get there. So we'll have that going on for the next uh, two weeks um, starting Tuesday. And then after that, uh, starting on Monday, uh, August 9th, we'll have the High Ridge closed and, Cad- and Cahill be opened up. So... That's the big stuff coming up um, in terms of uh, traffic um, closures and that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, we definitely have a lot of kind of cool storm work going on out there. Uh, they're rocking, so they're you know, undercutting all that stuff, uh, pulling up the, the existing dirt and, and laying down that newly crushed uh, concrete. So that's definitely exciting that we have some electrical work, some uh, new conduit being laid down there. And, uh, yeah, some concrete, some bridge work, uh, the modular block walls, and um, the box culvert. So, yeah, a lot of work going on. <laughs> Just about everything. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, we have a lot of uh, – this is kind of, like, you know, the biggest mobilization where the, we got a lot of different crews on site. So doing a lot of different things. It's yeah, cool. I definitely would suggest for uh, folks traveling through there that allow extra time. Mm-hmm. Be patient with the crews. You got trucks coming in and out of there, uh, yep. in and out of traffic there. Um, so you got to be safe. Uh, any other safety tips, Andrew, that you could share in yeah, that corridor? For sure. I know we've I've gotten some complaints about trucks pulling out and stuff. You know, it's it's tricky. I think you know timbers get get hot when uh you know when there's delays and stuff like that. So just you know, please everybody try to be patient with us. And uh, you know, we all, all start telling our crews you know to be courteous and make sure we're you know giving plenty of space. But yeah, please go slow. Give our, our crews um, some space to work and uh, you know. We'll, we'll make it through this. Uh, hopefully, you know, by November, everything will just be a perfect new road, and uh, we can look back on this and, and say, you know, this this worked worked out pretty well. But if there are issues, feel free to call us. I know, you know, I hear a lot from folks, and certainly with some of these closures, um, we had a lot of uh, complaints coming up with uh, the CADIS signal timing. So we we did update that last week, and and so we'll be continuing to monitor that throughout these closures. So. And talk about the detour, because I just took the detour for the first time, too, um, during kind of the peak traffic uh, traffic time. Uh, I don't need you to, like, you don't have to spell it out, like, lane by lane, but but that is a good alternative to get around uh, the project. Uh, yeah, I mean, we definitely have pedestrian bike detours for things that we're, we're fully closing. Um, I mean, certainly southbound uh, fish in the PM peak is usually when we see the most backups, and so... You know, certainly the detours there would be to take Beltline over to Seminole or to Verona Road um, to kind of get down to, back to McKee if that's where you're going and, and coming back and, and or utilizing Lacey. So, I mean, I think those are kind of the biggest ones. I'm happy to kind of, you know, point that out on the website and and, uh, and kind of give you some pictures of what those detours look like. Well, how about this, Andrew? Where can they find all that information? Sure, yeah, yeah. If you go <laughs> online to the project website on uh, the, the city's uh, website, uh, we have, you know, construction updates um, weekly, and so we just posted this one and all the detour plans and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. 
yeah, it's good. It, they're good route, easy route. So um, mm-hmm. I took one of them, uh, posted routes, yeah. and uh, worked out really well. So got me around the traffic, and I think more people could utilize that certainly during that peak time because sure. I was almost backed up to the belt line yep. <laughs> on yeah. the south spot. So uh, definitely uh, plan ahead. All right, we got some chip sealing uh, continuing uh, this week. Uh, tell us about the chip sealing going on up in the post road area. Yeah, we got post road index uh, out on East Clayton as well. Um, and so that's, you know, it, it kind of put down uh, kind of, you know, emulsion uh, up front and they lay the chips down and then they come back the next day to kind of sweep those up. So uh, you'll see, you know, today a lot of that work got done. Please don't park on there though yet because we're coming back tomorrow um, to sweep that up. So, uh, but yeah, that should be all kind of wrapped up. There's a few little spots on Osmondson north of McKee that they'll be uh, finishing up. Uh, he, either this week or, or early next week. So, um, and yeah. is what is chip sealing overall like? How what is the the idea behind that? Yeah, so this kind of a preservation treatment. So we, we don't do that on kind of the roads that are really far gone. It's kind of the more like five to ten year uh, roads that were recently constructed, and really just kind of gives that a new surface running course and uh, prevents kind of water infiltration just to get extend the life of the uh, of the road. So we also typically do chip sealing along with that, or uh, sorry, a crack filling along with that, just to again just try to prevent that water to get in the roadbed. Yeah, it does, yeah, it doesn't stay. Is right now it's pretty uh, dusty and stuff, but that mm-hmm. definitely goes away uh, after time and yep. as that starts to. And certainly settle. once once you sweep, it gets a lot better. But there still might be a few kind of uh, loose aggregate in there for a couple weeks, and then yeah, definitely gets better. All right, fantastic. Uh, finally, just over uh, at our uh, US fourteen uh, uh, Highway fourteen McCoy yep. uh, road work. How is that? Uh, uh, proceeding. Yeah, work is continuing there. There's no kind of permanent closures there. It's just kind of uh, off and on, kind of intermittent while uh, while they need to do some work. So, you know, look out for delays there, but otherwise I don't have any specific uh, closures or anything to report. All right, finally, uh, South Syene Road uh, project. Uh, we're getting close to starting that uh, uh, project. What do you have for an update there? Yeah, so right now we're still on track for next week um, to start that up. Uh, so that will be the water main project followed up by the uh, street resurfacing project. Um, uh, you know, pending permits, and we're, we're still kind of working through that. So it might get pushed to the following week, but otherwise we're still shooting for next week. All right, perfect. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Nice seeing you in person for once. Yeah, and, uh, for sure. uh, hopefully, uh, we, we have to take this out on the road one time before yeah. construction season ends. We got plenty of time. But... Yeah, maybe we do it on the Ped Bridge or something. I was going to just say that. We should go out of the bridge and yeah. stand there. All right, you got it. We're going to make it happen. All right, Andrew McFadden, uh, information's on the website, FitchburgWI.gov. We'll take a quick break. More to come. You're watching Talking Fitchburg. Our hearts are made stronger by how we treat others. Put her there. The light you share can impact those around you, but so can the darkness. Later, twerps! Did Pete saying mean things bother you? So when you reach out to another person, (laughs) take a moment to consider how they will feel and let your heart be the key to making a difference. Because of you, someone's entire day, year, or even life can change. In every heart, there's hope. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. Welcome back into Talking Fitchburg. Wrapping up the show for today, I want to thank Andrew McFadden for joining us and sharing the information on the construction update. Hit the website, fitchburgwi.gov to learn more. It's right there on the, the page for watching us. Stay connected with Back TV and have a great day, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow for another TF.